This is Ants Manitoba, and you're listening to the Ants Manitoba ad on the Formacast podcast. I hope you're enjoying the podcast so far, and if not, well, maybe you could go watch some of my videos at Ants Manitoba on YouTube. I'm just kidding. This podcast is amazing. What's this? You're not following him on all of his socials? Follow Formacast on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. All right, back to the show. Welcome, Formica fans. Welcome to another episode of FormerCast Podcast, your source for everything ant keeping. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our third and final part of the Launch Day Marathon. And today we have a very special on two Campanatus species Campanatus basenticus and Campanatus novoroboticus. Did I say that right? I think I no. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> so we have a special guest today. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Ants Manitoba from the Ants Manitoba YouTube channel, here to talk about Campanatus Pennsylvanicensis and Campanatus Noveboricensis. Thank you so much. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to butcher those several times, so that's why I have someone here with me. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Cool. Well, as usual, I plan on bringing some type of ant keeping tip that I usually research research beforehand. But I'm going to let you do that part for me today. So what are some tips you suggest for beginners like myself and others out there? The number one tip I can suggest is the hardest tip to learn. And that is patience because everybody is so hyper attentive to checking their queens and checking and checking and watching. And it takes a lot to distance yourself and social distance from the test tubes. Keep that six feet and let them be chill because a lot of the time stress is the number one factor causing colony death and it's the hardest thing to overcome yeah i hear you like before the show we were talking it takes every fiber in my being not to open my closet door and look at all my ants (laughs) totally agree yeah so going back to last episode i was talking about different tools and stuff like that that an ant keeper would would need and I totally butchered the fact about the aspirator. I had no idea what it was until I looked it up. And today, I wish I actually had one. So today, the recording of Labor Day, 9-7-2020, at 9.40 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I know what an aspirator is. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> and so, yeah, most of the day today, I was looking for uh, I was looking for the Labor Day ant, just to see if I can, you know, catch a couple more. And um, I'm in the backyard and I'm looking around usually and I found a uh, I found a formica nest and I was like, shoot, they got like these got these holes everywhere and they got dirt everywhere. And I'm like, I'm not going to dig this thing up. It's probably going to take forever. So I'm like, OK, maybe I'll try flipping some stones around. So I took this, this rock and I flipped it and there's just tons of ants there. There was a formica nest next to a I think it was another laceous nest. Um but they like went at it there was like a little ant war just going on right in front of my face and i'm just like i'm scrambling and i'm like shit where is my aspirator i need this now (laughs) (laughs) so i can suck up all these ants in the aspirator but before the show started you were telling me about uh some like what like an aspirator gun instead of a yeah um I'm not even sure if they ever sold except for privately, but this oh. guy, he makes them and I think I bought mine for $40 and they're absolutely amazing. I've, I've charged it once and they're just these little guns that you definitely could not take through airport security and True. they are very, like, they're just so effective. It, it They're the best thing ever for collecting, especially if you're like trying to collect a small colony, you yeah. get everything. Yeah, mind you, this was not a small colony. This thing was yeah. like, yeah, there was yeah. a lot of ants. If you look on my Instagram, there's, I just have pictures and my, my feed is just going. You just see these ants everywhere. I was able actually to catch a queen uh, while I'm looking through this huge colony. I just see this thing dart across and I'm like, what the heck is going on here? I see a worker chasing her and I'm like, well... I hope it's, I don't know if it's their queen or if it's another queen because this thing was running for its life. So I was able to get it into a test tube and now it's in my closet. I tried, um, somebody told me to try putting some cocoons in there to see if she'll like open it up or something like that. Uh, I don't know what that's about, but. Hmm. Wait a minute. Is it the, the most recent post? The one? Yes. 
when she's like in the bottle of the glass thing. Yeah. Okay, it is really important that you go back and get workers actually. So if you take a queen out of her colony like that, um, it's really hard for her, especially you said it was a big colony, right? Well, here's the thing. I did get workers and I did get some of the pupae together with her, the cocoons. And I put a worker in there with her just to see what would happen, just to make sure it was the same one. This worker attacked her, like literally mm. attacked her and then she killed it. And I'm like, mm, okay, uh, yeah, that's not good. Yeah, so I'm like, so I was like, I don't think they're the same colony, but she was, it looked like she was running for her life. So well, I don't know. Maybe. So example, this is very possible. They probably didn't take up the entire rock. So there could have been like a sliver where she was on the side. And then all of a sudden, when you lifted the rock up, she went running straight into the unknowing colony that was right beside her. Oh, crap. I've had that happen where I found a few queens under the same rock that had no idea they were beside each other or like a massive colony. It, oh, wow. It, yeah, it could have been it, especially huh. if she was running for her life. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I saved her, but I don't know if she's going to lay any eggs. We'll find out. She'll hibernate, but she might. She might. Yeah. But yeah, I have okay. nine other of her species, hopefully. So mm -hmm. we actually had, um, I think they flew here today as well. Oh, yeah. I was cleaning up my pool and uh, I found a queen at the bottom. Oof. <laughs> Oof. Rest in peace. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, that's pretty much it for this part of this episode. We're going to take a quick break. Awesome, guys. We are back. Thank you for hanging out and waiting for us. All right, so we're going to go into a species highlight. Actually, we're going to do two of them. All right, so so what's the first one we're going to do today? Componatus pensenicus? Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Every time it changes. Every time it changes, right? Componatus pensylvanicensis. All right, so we're going to call it... That's what it's called? All right. It's called so the, the Campo Pen. <laughs> Campo Pen. All right. <laughs> That's what I'll call it from now on. <laughs> <laughs> so this species is the North American, first North American uh, carpenter ant to ever be described. Uh, it, its nests are usually living in, uh, they're usually living in, in living trees or, or dead trees, rotten logs or stumps of forests. This is important and destructive pest that attacks fences, poles, and buildings. This is probably why the most destructive carpenter ant in North America, according to Wheeler and Wheeler in 1963. Uh, although, uh, Craigerton in 1950 argued that its destructive ca uh, capabilities were somewhat and staggered in that, that they're only tunnel in decaying wood. It often forages inside homes and making it an important house pet. Pest. Not pet, but pest. <laughs> Reproductives. Pet. Yeah, it could be a pet. I want them as pets. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Reproductives were found in nests from, uh, April to October. The species is found in the same logs as stumps as other ants, such as Laceus, Formica, and some others. Workers tend uh, aphids, with the smaller workers collecting honeydew and transferring to large workers that carry it back to the nest. In addition, they are foragers feed on dead insects and plant juices, according to Ant Wiki. How does someone identify these giant ants? Usually, with pretty big, massive black ants, their gaster are over 0.2 millimeters long, and they have some erect hairs on their back, usually, don't they? Mm -hmm. uh, and then, according to McKay, New World Carpenter Ants in 2019, uh, Campbell Pen, I'll call that from now on, <laughs> is found in areas with clay or sandy brown soils, and it is found in a variety of plant communities ranging from urban uh, habitats to desert scrub and a few uh, bushes and farmland. <laughs> Grasslands and pine spruce surrounded by uh, grassland. Oak uh, dominated forest with palmetto understory and some weedy areas and hardwood forests. Um... One nest actually was found up to 75 feet up in a tree. That's pretty important. Yes. I, some of them are uh, arboreal, and it's really interesting, actually, to see them. Yeah. Uh, according to Harvard Forest, although carpenter ants are pests, they are, if they're fine nesting your home, they actually serve an important function in the forest ecosystem. 
They break down dead and dead standing fallen trees. That's pretty awesome, actually. That they're very helpful to the ecosystem. Um, so usually I found an article. I found an article here of school of ants. Um, so Dr. Dr. Eleanor has, has actually, I think, four books uh, on common ants from different areas of the United States. Um, where she basically, she has a part here in her article that says, what's the big deal? Basically, the carpenter ant is one of the United States' largest and friendliest ants because of their size and pleasant deposition. They make excellent ambassadors between the, the ant and human world. When I was little, I took my breakfast crumbs out to the front yard to feed the black carpenter ants living in the willow oak trees. I built three piles of bacon and toast for them on top of oak trees and waited for them to lumber out from the holes uh, hidden in the bark at the base of trees. You can identify black carpenter ants by looking at their size. They're huge. And a light, dusty, golden hairs on their head and thorax settle on their abdomens. Unlike many ant species, black carpenter ants vary in size, shape, and with the colony. Uh, between one-fourth and a little over one-half inch long, a, a small carpenter ant can comfortably straddle a plain m and and one can just about straddle a dime. Colonies are usually between 350 to 1,000 workers, which depends on a worker size. Uh, it works out to about uh, $200 worth of dimes banged around inside of those trees from our deliciousness, up to 40 bags of M&Ms. <laughs> Shoot. Uh, let's see. Uh, care. Usually care. Uh, on the former culture forum, there is a couple articles on care for different species. Uh, we're going to go over their mating flight. So usually their mating flight starts in spring and they'll fly it as early as March and late as July. Uh, they are fully claustral. Um, they're... What's the difference between one queen and two queens? Or one queen uh, and many one queens? Monogenous or polygynous. Yeah, so they're monogenous. Mm -hmm. Um, and then their average time from worker from egg to worker, egg to larva is about 20 to 30 days. Larva to pupa is about 10 to 15 days. And oh pupa God, to so... worker is 18 to 25. Yeah, it's super long. Uh, recommended temperature is 75 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit or 24 to 27 degrees Celsius. Uh, it is a heat loving ant. So heating cables preferred hibernate them at roughly 20, uh, 46 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit or 8 to 13 degrees Celsius. Queens found in a warmer location might prefer more heat. Recommended humidity. Queens found in some desert locations may prefer a lower humidity. Um, queens found in more temperate locations prefer a higher humidity. Different stages of brood will capture different humidity levels. Uh, preferred foods, insects, including crickets, termites, fruit flies, houseflies, mealworms, spiders, grasshoppers, and locusts. Sweets include sugar, honey, syrup, um, and variety of fruits. This species is also a social stomach, so keep that in mind when it comes to food. Hibernation details requires hibernation at three to five months is recommended depending on where the queen is collected so definitely for uh united states and canada is and definitely over europe probably it's probably going to be long months of hibernation mm -hmm. actually something that they don't mention anywhere so far that i think is an interesting point is um <clears throat> campanatus all i'm pretty sure all campanatus do this mm -hmm. um the elates that fly in the summer they mm -hmm. actually, I can't remember if it's they lay more lates or they just have elates that don't fly, but they carry elates over winter to the next year Huh? throughout the winter. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I, I haven't really seen too many things talk about this, but it's kind of just a neat little, I don't know why they do it exactly. Um, yeah. Maybe just saving on food or something, but yeah, as well as, um, yeah, they are very slow growers indeed. Um, yeah. yeah they're a beginner species but they it's something that frustrates people because they just they're like what am i doing wrong and it's just because it takes so long yeah that's why a lot of big carbonate colonies don't exist because people get impatient <laughs> yeah 
I I really want them super bad, but here at the house, they, yeah, they don't want carpenter ants in the house. So, uh, my my housemate uh, Joe, he was like, yeah, why don't you uh, why don't you build a shed? You can keep your ants outside. I'm like, I can't do that in the winter; they'll die. <laughs> yeah. So, I was like, well, if we build a shed, then I need to make sure there's a space heater in there. I gotta make sure there's a little fridge. You know, I gotta make sure I have tables so I can actually keep all my ants there and everything. Well, and a wine cooler works really well. Yeah. Because you can regulate the temperature and and like letting it fade and stuff. I, I don't know. Maybe this this I just know somebody who has one, but it, it's probably some like techie yeah. one. My uh my dad actually has one, and he's he's like uh planning on and like traveling around the United States and stuff, and he's actually gonna give me his wine cooler. So yeah, that might actually work really well. Yeah. Um, unless he sold it. Hopefully he didn't sell it. Um. <laughs> Let's see. So also, yeah, there's escape barrier methods. Flu on and Intel computer is effective to contain them. They're unable to climb upside down on olive oil. Vaseline or olive oil are a vertical surface will not contain them. I would um, say they can't climb like, like I don't really have a barrier on mine at all. Really? And they, they just, yeah, they, I like, I have an Ants Australia world for my colony right now. Yeah. And I don't even have a barrier because they just can't climb it. Huh. That's they, interesting. Yeah. They're too big. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I didn't know they actually bite. They can and will bite. Well, it says the pain will fade, but like I've been bit by a major as big as a queen and they, it doesn't really hurt. The only huh. thing that hurts is when they get you in like a like a, like a little crevice, like your fingernail and your skin right where it attaches. If uh, one bites you there, that, that, that hurts a little bit. Oh, does it? But if they just bite your normal skin on your hand, it, it doesn't hurt very much. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah uh let's see special care and interest notes as they're as carpenter ants are able to chaw chew through soft plastics and, and plaster sometimes a whole cotton ball uh also these ants are especially suitable uh accessible to chemicals and they require an extra uh, ventilation airflow as they can produce a strong formatic acid gas and startled or alarmed didn't know mm-hmm. that uh, yeah that's something that I see a lot of people don't do is um, you don't give enough like that's I actually leave my outworld top open completely. People are like, are you serious? It's carpenter ants. I'm like, you know what? They're not gonna get out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got um harvester ants coming from Tar Heel ants. I think mm. next week. they don't need a barrier either. They can't do anything. Really? <laughs> nope, they can't climb. But I mean, you can as long as it's like the right kind of acrylic. But yeah, they yeah like they need nothing no barrier well from my experience anyway yeah give nuts please they love them dandelion seeds and walnuts my best oh yeah i uh i'm getting the dandelion seeds and then i'll probably go get some walnuts yes but um but i'm getting the mini hearth with it so Mm -hmm. it'll be pretty sweet yeah just be careful with cleaning it because like it's the only nest i've ever had an issue with because like they're amazing i don't want to go too off topic but mini hearths are absolutely amazing they yeah. have, they grew a tetramorium from 15 workers to 150 in like 30 days. Like I, they just exploded. I don't know. Or sorry, more like 60. But awesome. it was really it was really they loved it. Issue when mold forms in the outworld, you cannot get rid of it if it's a certain type. Like I have scraped layers of that sand stuff off, like the grout. Oh, I've geez. scraped yeah. layers away. The mold is in that. It's down inside. Oh, so if it gets in the nest, you can't clean it. And that's that's the only issue that I've really found is like cleaning them is imp- like once there's mold, it's really hard to like fix that. Dang. Um, but yeah, um, I should be getting that sometime next week. I heard it takes like two weeks for them to get everything ready and send it. Yeah. The only thing, so the dilemma kind of is like to keep in mind. Okay. So example, Pognarmex they they love heat and they also love humidity Hmm. so if you have too much humidity in the nest the seeds will sprout interesting seeds sprout and then they die they mold Uh oh i you know those like three test tube chamber things yeah the inserts i had a queen in one of those and a seed sprouted and it molded the whole inside and then i realized i couldn't take the insert out so it's i'm like i can't even use this anymore Uh oh it's like ugh. So that's that's like the only issues I've run into so far. But other than that, they've been really good. Cool. Yeah, I'll keep that in mind. Um. So yeah, we got one more species for today: Campanatus nova baraconsis. 
Did so I get it right? Close. So close. So close. Caponata's Novi Borakensis. It's like, you basically had it. Awesome. You right. believe there. <laughs> <laughs> so, same as, I'll just call it Compo Pen. Um, <laughs> they nest in rotten wood, in and under logs and stumps, in dead branches on the ground, and under bark, boards, and even in also under stones, even cow dung. I didn't know that. Actually, um, I didn't either. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they're found in, uh, in hollow twigs. Colonies are small with about 3,000 workers. That is not small. Yeah, um, that's not small. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Gibson, 1819, or 1889, discusses the production of uh, soldiers during colony growth. With older colonies have a higher proportion of majors. Brood and sexuals were found in nests in June, August, and September. The late females were collected in April, June, July, and August. A flight was observed in June... 21st and 22nd, according to McKay 2019. Uh, so what makes these different from their pen counterparts is usually the red mesomoma? They're mesosoma. The mesosoma, yeah. There's, I think there's a few letters in that. Wait, wait, meses... Oh, yeah, never mind. Yeah. Uh, and then I put their backs, quote, unquote. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they're very attractive to the eye. Uh, I really want these over the, the, the other one. <laughs> Um, oh, dude, I agree. Yeah, they're very cool looking. Um, they're found all over North America, uh, mainly in the east and southern Canada. Um, Pennant is all over the United States from the east coast to eastern part of Texas to up to North Dakota. Um, nuptial flights are from April to July, when Pennant is only around July. Uh, Nova comes to the Latin word from New York interesting interesting because you know you know pen versus nove the difference that i like i don't know if you've noticed this but pennsylvania Kansas queens or sorry pennsylvanicus i said too much there i said more than i god i, <laughs> I extended the name <laughs> they're like a matte black like they kind of like they're not shine but they're like matte black yeah versus noves are like shiny red and black yeah so, was... so yeah while I was doing the research on this, I was looking at both of these species, looking at the comparison between the two. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my gosh, they're so cool. Like just, just the way that they're just like, just the way they look and like stuff like that. But, but nothing compares to like the stuff Enderan has on his Insta. Right. His, his like yellow Campanatus queens that are like see-through and you're just like, what? I know, right? What? uh let's see so the new york carpenter ant you may see in the species written lacking the f a first nova bird consists but the species was originally described as a formica species yeah. by fitch in 1854 so that spelling takes precedence and then for care uh for care uh, natural habitat is found in moist wood under dead fall lumber in old houses also known to nest under rocks in rocky locations uh, they're mostly nocturnal but will forage in the day mating flight will occur, will occur in May and June with scattered flights between July and August ideal conditions are a day after rain warm and humid midday to afternoon while they are known to fly in periods with no rain, they're fully cross rolled and they're monogamous. Um, let's see. Although you can sometimes, or they've been recorded to have more than one queen. That's cool. Um, Nove? Yep, Nove. Yeah, okay. That is, sorry to interrupt you. That was the regional thing that we were, like, it's such a debate. Yeah. It is such a debate. <laughs> sorry, keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're fine. Um, average time from egg to worker, uh, egg to larva, 20 to 30 days, larva to pupa, 10 to 15, pupa to worker, 18 to 25. Time will vary with the temperature. Recommended temperature, 75 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit or 24 to 27 degrees Celsius. Recommended humidity, mid humidity of 30 to 50% and 20 to lower is known for caused dermotes and pupae. Um... Preferred foods, honey, water, sugar, apples, pears, oranges, mealworms, superworms, 
June beetles, isopods, earwigs, crickets, grasshoppers, most sugary foods, and insects are readily accepted. Uh, and the wild temperatures below freezing is common up to 40 degrees Fahrenheit to Celsius. Uh, this is hibernation details, my bad. And cap uh, captivity is advised to stay above freezing point as we're unable to easily duplicate the slowdown process in freezing temps to allow the antifreeze in their blood to work properly. Hibernation is recommended between 30 degrees, 39 degrees Fahrenheit to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 4 degrees Celsius and 10 degrees Celsius. I don't know why they didn't put those like side by side. It just made me confused. Uh, flu on and Talcium powder works really well. Works best for escape barrier methods. And they're unable to talk up. They're unable. Did he just say unable? Yeah, to talk I, I just down? <laughs> screenshot that you had sent it because I was trying to warn you. It says unable to talk upside down. Yeah. So, um, so unfortunately, there's a typo in here, guys. It's um, not him. It's a real typo. <laughs> yeah. So there's a real typo in here. It says they're unable to walk upside down, not talk upside down, on olive oil and smooth surface. Um, difficulty reading. They're very easy to keep. If you have the patience, um, they can bite. The majors or queens are unable to break the skin. They're also known to dab droplets of formic acid with their gaster into the wound, causing a slight stinging sensation. Um, they prefer warmth and plenty of food sources. And yeah, that's pretty much it for our species. Yeah. Wrong one. All right. So yeah, that's pretty much the two species for the highlight for this episode. So before we end this show, why don't you go ahead and tell the audience what it's like to actually take care of carpenter ants? I know you have a different species of carpenter ants, but why don't you go ahead and tell us? I've actually kept Camponatus noviborcensis, Camponatus pensylvanicus, and also Camponatus modic. Um, modic are really pretty, actually, but the biggest thing I've kept is uh, a colony of um, Camponatus nericticus. I think that's how you say it correctly. And uh, it's four queen. They all are different colors, so they all have different types of colors. So each queen lays workers with different um, tricolors and stuff. It's really cool. Oh, sure. But there was quite there. They uh, when I got them, um, somebody had a colony on a log, and they were concerned because there was like no workers coming out of the log, and they they didn't think there was like really much of a colony in there, like maybe a small one, but it was a big log. So I took it because they didn't want it, and I'm like, okay, it's been a month, and I've been trying to get them to move. So I decided to hack into that log. Yeah. The first split that I got in that log that just came pouring out and i'm like oh my goodness so i grabbed my aspirator <laughs> yeah grab the and aspirator. I started vacuuming and then i'm like okay now i gotta take a very slow approach because that could that could have been really risky so i started kind of like shaking things out and peeling away into this log and eventually i got everything into a nest and i think there was like around 400 to 500 workers maybe at the time yeah but they were going strong brood production was so like it was insane the beginning of this year for them was nuts they were like um when spring kind of started they were probably around i'd say they had like 300 new eggs laid like there was a whole chamber dedicated to eggs it was crazy yeah but i fed them an apple um one day like i do most of my colonies all the time i feed them fruit and stuff not just honey yeah and all of a sudden the next day I go to take it out because it was starting like they'd eaten most of it and I all the queens and stuff are like shaking legs and all the workers are like their legs are like shaking and I'm like what's going on I think what was happening is there was pesticides on the oh, skin no. of the apple and luckily they survived all the queens survived but there's only about 20 workers remaining right now oh man huge toll but they're still all alive so next year we'll they're will be their rebirth so it's unfortunate what happened and taking them through hibernation will be interesting this year but it'll it's going to be a challenge and i'm going to make sure that they're as ready as they can and yes keep them up but yeah it's going to be an interesting journey with them um yeah yeah you, you're definitely gonna have to like shoot some videos and like 
keep us all in like in the loop what's going on with them because i remember watching the video of that giant larva you dropped in i there. know oh my gosh i'm like no <laughs> <laughs> dude they they could not break into that thing and i don't usually feed live so it was just quite the experience with that but yeah they were going yeah. crazy for it okay. and um they, yeah it, it was unfortunate though but yeah dude i had such high hopes for that colony and then that something like that happened and i'm just like oh dang like this is not good so yeah but i'm sure they'll make a recovery um they they have been like like amazing like they would when i give them an apple they all that's left of it is just the skin like they eat the whole apple they don't just drink the juices they like eat the apple it's crazy yeah. that's that is amazing but yeah i really hope to like re-document from day one come next spring and just like follow up more more like uh series videos rather than just random episodes like more like a series on them yeah that'd be awesome you should do like a uh like a series like ants canada has like a series on his ants and and like kind of do a parody on it <laughs> yeah, that's true <laughs> that'd be awesome but yeah so let's go ahead and wrap this up thank you again so much buddy for coming on to the show um why don't we go ahead and plug in your social media really quick so for my socials, everything's basically just Ants Manitoba. My YouTube's Ants Manitoba. My TikTok's Ants Manitoba. As well as my Instagram is Ants Manitoba. So you could de definitely check me out on all those platforms. Um, I'm pretty active and I definitely respond to all DMs. So hit me up if you have any questions. Awesome. Uh, so guys, our Discord community is booming. Like literally almost every time I look at my phone, there's like a new person join news person join i'm like heck yeah uh, so yeah come and check out our discord the link will be in the show notes we actually do have a youtube channel that every episode that layer that goes live and that airs on our spotify and all the other podcasting listening places will be uploaded onto youtube so that people can quote unquote watch them on youtube what's coming up next you guys will find out keep your eyes on social media update on our ants currently my ants are in the closet and i'm not looking at them <laughs> yes good good you're learning this i'm learning good. they're in boxes they're nice and cozy in their boxes and test tubes that's where they're staying until next week when i look at them for the next time but for now they stay in there um any updates you want to give on our ants before we close up um I actually kept a lot of my stuff a secret for a little bit because oh. I have some I have some stuff that I got mm -hmm. and it's some species that I had featured in the past that unfortunately didn't make it like single queens but I've gotten some really really neat species that are not a lot of people keep I don't know oh. it's not because they're like really rare or anything but it's just kind of like mm -hmm. kind of just strange and you know like maybe some yeah. super small species <clears throat> temnothorax <clears throat> just drop one in there for you <laughs> but yeah. yeah it's it's interesting you know they're really good shots i actually featured some in that my previous video but um there's not too much i want to update on really although although everybody wants a tetramorium update because the first video that everyone like that video did really well a lot of people wanted to see a part two yeah and all i can say for now is that the colony is definitely in about 300 to 500 worker range and they're almost taking up a full four inch by four inch and it's canada ac nest so they are booming right now they're my they're that is on awesome. the way up there tetramorium are if you have them in your area and you're trying to start 100 percent species to go to that's awesome. I know I have them in my area. I just haven't been able to find it yet. So. Gotta get them, dude. Tetramorium oh. are the way to go to start. You just throw anything at them and they eat it. Are you team exotic? Do you keep exotic ants? I do have a messer queen, but I have a yeah. permit. Oh, okay. And I also have some uh, contacts with the with a university in Winnipeg, oh. just about stuff like that. It's it's um oh, okay. Yeah, it's it's nice. Um. Also, Canada and exotics is like you, you can just ship something from Europe and they'll just ship it to you and no one asks yeah. questions. It's a little sketchy. Um, yeah. I I think exotics are cool. There's some things that I would never like. Okay, like Ada is so cool, but I think I'd want to document them rather than keep them just because I feel like keeping them would be like a disturbance. But at the same time, I, I if I ever get the chance to with a permit or something like that, I'm definitely going to give it a try. I think the biggest thing is like the plants and 
plants not being native that they their fungus needs so it's kind of just like it's not going to happen but yeah be really really cool to see something like that happen Alrighty, so everybody else you can guys can find me on pretty much all social media facebook at cast underscore for me oh actually no it's my twitter uh facebook is the former cast podcast and instagram is former cast podcast that's pretty much it for today's episode thank you guys for listening and we're out see you later guys hey guys durka here i just wanted to really thank everyone in the ant keeping community for really showing the show some love you guys have been posting and reposting joining the discord dming me on instagram and telling me how excited you are for the show it really means a lot to me a lot of work was put into this show over the labor day weekend and i want to thank my team my administration team on our discord for stepping up and helping with the community what it is how can you help the show a few ways you can tell others Tell them to listen to the show. Word of mouth is usually the best way to promote something. After the show, go ahead and write and review, download, follow, and most of all, tell someone. I would like to thank Ants Motitoba for joining me on this special episode. That was so much fun and we need to do that again. Content creators, reach out to me at formacastpodcast at gmail.com or hit me up on Instagram if you want to be next. Signing out until next week. See you Monday.